Hey, our own Rabinowitz here for RedGiantTV.com. In this highly fashionable yet very casual designer episode of Red Giant TV, Michael Park, who leads the Trap Code Forum at Creative Cow, will be showing us how to use Trap Code Particular to create the look of stitches being sewn into a pair of jeans, or as my parents like to call them, dungarees. Now, this technique can be used for a whole bunch of cool stuff, and Mike will talk more about that at the end of the tutorial, as well as how you can use that information for a chance to score yourself a copy of his new training DVD from Creative Cow. Take it away, Mike. Thanks, Aaron. Hey guys, Michael Park excited to be back with you with a new tutorial that'll have you in stitches. No, I haven't gotten any funnier in the last few months. We are literally going to be creating a stitch pattern using Trap Code Particular. Now the really critical thing to learn here is how to auto-orient the particles to the direction of the emitter's movement. Now I know what you're saying. Doesn't Particular 2 already have an auto-orient feature that'll take care of this for us? Well, the answer is kind of. Particular's auto-orient feature only works if the particles are moving or have a velocity. Now I'm no software engineer, but I'm guessing this feature utilizes the velocity vector of each individual particle to determine the rotation or orientation in 3D space. As I said, this works great when particles are moving, but what happens if particles are stationary? The answer is, auto-orientation no longer works. So does this mean that we can't auto-orient stationary particles? Well, if that were the case, I wouldn't be doing this tutorial, now would I? With the help of expressions and a little trigonometry, we'll have this knocked out in no time. So sit down, don't go running for cover quite yet. If the mere mention of the word trigonometry made you break out in cold sweat, don't worry, the explanation and the expression are pretty short and pretty painless. Now for those of you who don't really care about the math behind the expression, I'll go ahead and post up the final expression so you can skip ahead. And for those intrepid few willing to traverse the treacherous trig terrain, wow, try saying that five times fast, you will be rewarded with mathematical enlightenment and have everything you've ever dreamed of. Or maybe just sound a little smarter at cocktail parties. Well, enough of this frivolity. Let's get down to the math. In order to understand why this rotational function works like it does, we need to understand some basic math. Now the concept here is we want to convert the positional data described by the x and y values of the particular emitter and change those to polar coordinates described by a radius and an angle. Now there are two ways to describe a point in the same space. One is the Cartesian method using an x and y value to denote space on an xy grid. The other is using a polar coordinate where you use an angle from 0 to 360 degrees and the radius defines how far out from the origin the point is in space. So for purposes of our function, we're going to be using the velocity vector from the particular emitter to give us our x and y values. Then we need to translate those x and y values into values for a radius and an angle. For our purposes, the radius really doesn't matter. What we really are after is the angle. Now, if you go back to your high school mathematics class, you may remember graphing points on a grid. Think of both the x and y values of the velocity as sides to a right angle triangle. Then the line connecting those sides, or the hypotenuse, would then be the radius of the polar coordinate. Now, good old Pythagoras gave us a theorem back in the day that described the radius as being equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared, or r squared equal x squared plus y squared. Now, like I said, the radius doesn't really matter for our purposes today. I just think that saying Pythagoras makes me feel smart. What we really are after is the trigonometric function of the tangent of the angle is equal to y divided by x. So if we solve for the angle and divide by the tangent or multiply by the arc tangent of the angle, we end up with an expression which describes the angle in terms of y and x. Therefore, we can convert Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates. Now, if you didn't understand any of that, maybe I can simplify it for you. We found a way to take the x and y and find the angle. Great. We're done, right? Well, not quite, because After Effects, like any other good program beyond the elementary level of mathematics, expresses angles in terms of radians. Don't know what a radian is? Well, I'm glad you asked. The definition of a radian is as follows. The radian is a unit of you know what? Never mind. You could read this yourself. All you need to know is we can't use radians directly with particular. We need to convert the radian to degrees. Fortunately for us, After Effects uses JavaScript, which has a mathematical function designed to do specifically that. If you simply type radians to degrees, you can easily convert the angular measurement in radians to degrees. Just make sure you watch the capitalization. It does matter. Now to call up the arctangent function in JavaScript, you type math.arctangent 
a tan. But if you use this function in our expression, you'll find you only get half the angular values. And that's because positive y divided by positive x is functionally the same as negative y divided by negative x. Similarly, negative y divided by positive x is the same as positive y divided by negative x. So the arctangent expression will yield the same result for points in different quadrants. Obviously, this is incorrect. What a headache, right? Well, not really. Fortunately for us, JavaScript has another function which will take care of this for us automatically. All we need to do is type math.atan2. Now we get all 360 degrees of freedom. Finally, to get the velocity of the particular emitter, all we need to do is pick whip to it and then type dot velocity. This will return an array of two values which represent the magnitude of the velocity in both the x and y directions. Simply put, it gives us our x and y. Now on to the final expression. We're going to declare a variable v, which will be the position of our emitter, dot velocity. Throw a semicolon after that and hit return, and then type radians to degrees, which will convert the angle from radians to degrees, of math dot arctangent two of the velocity of v open bracket one close bracket, or our y velocity, comma, v open bracket zero close bracket or our x velocity. Make sure you have the right number of closed parentheses and you're ready to go. See, that wasn't so bad, was it? Now let's get down to building our scene. Let's fire up After Effects and create a new composition by choosing Composition, New Composition, or hitting Control N. Let's call this comp Stitches. I'm going to be working at 1280 by 720 with a frame rate of 30 frames per second. I'm also going to be using a duration of 12 seconds. Click OK to accept these settings. Next, I'm going to double click in the project window and import the footage that I'll be using for this project. Let's grab the Flourish PNG and drop it into our timeline. What we're going to do is trace the outlines of this design and then place stitches on those outlines. First, we need to create some masks from this image. So with the layer selected, choose Layer, Auto Trace. Now make sure you're on current frame, not work area, so you're not doing the whole thing, just this current frame, and change the channel to luminance. The default settings here look pretty good. Make sure you have applied it to a new layer, and then choose OK. Next, with a new layer selected, hit M to reveal the masks. As you can see, we have three masks, one on the left, one in the middle here, and one on the right. I'm going to recolor these so that I can see them a little more clearly. For mask one, I'll pick a little blue color. For mask two, I'll pick a pink color. And mask three, I'll leave yellow. Now one thing I need to mention right away is that if it's important to you where the stitches start, you're going to need to go ahead and select the mask point you want to start as the first node. So for example, I'm going to want my stitches to start at this position, this position, and maybe at the top of the middle here. So I'm going to go ahead into those masks and select those individual points as the first point of the mask. Let's go ahead and zoom in so we can see what we're doing. So if we select the first point here, right click and choose mask and shape path, set first vertex. When we paste this path in as a motion path to the emitter, the emitter will start at the top here and then go around and return here. We need to do the same thing with the other two masks. Let's select this point right here and choose set first vertex. And once again, we'll choose this point on the other mask and make it the first vertex as well. Next, we need to create three new null objects. So from the menu, choose Layer, New, Null Object. Let's name this first one Center. Let's hit Control D to duplicate it. Name the next one Left. Hit Control D to duplicate that and make this one Right. Let's also rename our masks so that we can clearly identify which masks are which. Rename this to Center. Rename the pink one to Left. And rename the yellow one to Right. Next, let's select our three nulls and hit P to reveal their positions. Let's grab the mask path from the center and hit Control C to copy it. And then click on the position of the center null and hit Control V. As you can see, we've pasted keyframes into the position based on the mask. Another interesting thing to note is the motion path made by pasting the mask path into the position of the null object actually roves across time, which means if you slide the last or the first keyframe, the rest of the keyframes adjust proportionately. Now this is critical because we want the stitches to be evenly spaced, so we want the velocity of the null object and subsequently the emitter linked to it to be the same throughout the entire motion. Now that we've got the center one done, we can grab the left mask path, copy it by hitting Control C and pasting it into the position of the left null, and likewise do the same thing for the right.
Since I wasn't at frame zero when I pasted the keyframes in, they've been pasted where my time indicator is. No problem, we can simply slide these back over to the beginning of the composition. The next thing I want to do is take the left and right null positions, grab those keyframes at the end, and drag them all the way down to the end of my composition at 12 seconds. I want the animation to last the entire time of the composition. Later on, we'll adjust the position keyframes of the center so that we can match the stitch spacing in the left and right designs. All right, believe it or not, we're almost done. All we need to do now is put in our particles. So I'm gonna hide both the auto trace layer and the initial flourish layer, and I'm going to choose layer, new solid, or control Y. I'm gonna call this layer stitch left. Make sure it's comp size and the color really doesn't matter, and hit okay. And to this layer, I'm going to add effect, trap code, particular. Next, twirl down the emitter settings and let's change the velocity from 100 to zero, the velocity random to zero, and the velocity from motion to zero. Select the left null and hit P to reveal its position. Now let's go back to the emitter and I'll click the stopwatch of the position XY and pick whip this to the left null position. Now if you scrub through the timeline, you can see the particles are being emitted along the motion path of the null. If you zoom in, you can see that the particles are not evenly spaced. Let's go ahead and pull the particles per second down so we can see the spacing a little bit better. At 40 particles per second, you can see that we've got spacing between the particles, but it's uneven, and that's not what we want. Now the trick to get even spacing is to have the particles per second be a multiple of the frames per second of the composition. In our case, that's 30 or 29.97, so if we change the particles per second to 29.97, and click OK, we now have even spacing all along our path. The next thing we want to do is change the particle type and also the particle life. Back in our project, let's grab the stitch PNG and drag that into our composition. As you can see, this is nothing more than an image of a yellow colored piece of yarn, but it'll work great for our purposes. Let's go ahead and turn that off and then back in the particular settings, scrub down here to the particle settings. Let's change the particle life from three to 12 and also change the particle type from sphere to textured polygon. Twirl down the texture dialog box and change the layer from none to stitch. Change the time sampling from current time to random still frame. Now if we zoom in here, you can see that all the stitches are going the same way. Now it's time to deploy our expression. Let's twirl down the rotation dialog box and I'll click the rotate Z stopwatch. First let's type V equals and then grab the pick whip and pick whip the XY position of the particle emitter, dot velocity, semicolon, now type radians to degrees, making sure to remember the capitalization, open parentheses, capital math, dot a tan two, open parentheses, V, open bracket one, or the Y velocity value, comma, V open bracket zero or the X velocity value, close parentheses, close parentheses. Now if you hit enter on your number pad and everything worked right, you should see that the particles now align to the motion path. All right, I think the stitches are a little big, so let's go down here to the size and change the size from five to three. Now if you like the size of the stitches, but you don't like how far they're spaced out, you can do a couple different things. The first thing you could do is to multiply the particles per second to double that. So instead of 29.97, we can use the value of 59.976. Now you can see the stitches have all filled in, but if you zoom in here, you can see we have some problems with the rotation values of our particles. And that's because the velocity is being sampled once per frame or every approximately 30 frames, but we're having two particles emitted per frame. The best way to fix this is actually to change the frame rate of your composition. So with the composition selected, choose composition, composition settings, and we can change the frame rate from 30 up to 60. Now you'll see that using particles per second of 59.976 with a composition frame rate of 60 frames per second gives us much better results because each particle has its own individual velocity. Pretty nifty, huh? All right, we've done all the hard work and we've got everything lined up the way we want it, I think. So the next thing we need to do is simply duplicate this layer by selecting it and hitting Control D. And let's rename this stitch right. Now hit U to reveal all of the expressions and all we need to do is change the name of the null that the position XY is looking to from left to right. Now if you hit enter in your number pad, you can see we have the stitches being applied to the right side. 
but you'll notice there's a problem. This isn't symmetrical. While it starts at the right point, it's going the wrong way around the motion path. Well, that's not really a problem because we can come down here to the right null and hit P to reveal the position. Let's select the position and then go up here to animation and choose keyframe assistant, time reverse keyframes. Now if you scrub through the timeline, you can see that the stitches come on in a mirror image. Exactly what we want. All right, finally, let's grab the stitch right, hit Control D to duplicate it. Let's rename this stitch center. Once again, let's hit U to reveal the expressions and change the right parameter here to center. Now you can see we have the center stitches, but they're a little close together. We can fix this by adjusting the timing of the null motion. Let's grab the center null and hit P to reveal its position. Now let's grab the last keyframe and let's drag it backwards in time, condensing the keyframes until we get the spacing that we want. Maybe just a hair more and I think we're there. There, that looks much better. The final thing we may want to do with the center stitches is turn the particular emitter off once it reaches the final destination. That way we don't keep emitting particles at the end. Let's make sure we're on the last keyframe for the stitches and then set a keyframe for the particles per second for the center stitches. Move down one frame by hitting page down and then take this value all the way to zero. This is looking pretty good, but I think we want to add just a little more visual interest by duplicating this layer and having the same design come on on top. Now an easy way to do this is grab the stitches composition in the project window and hit Control D to duplicate it. Let's now grab these first stitches and drop it into a new composition and rename this comp final comp and then grab the second stitches composition and drop that in below. Let's hit S to reveal its scale and let's scale it in the Y direction negative 100 to flip it. Now we have our stitches designed, but I think we need a background. Back in the project window, let's grab the denim PNG and drop that below. Let's hit S to scale this down to about 50%. Now we want to expand the background a bit, so choose Effect, Stylize, Motion Tile, and let's change the output width from 100 to 300, and change the output height to 600. Now, while looking pretty cool, we still lack that wow factor. Let's add a camera move to really punch this up a notch. From the menu, choose Layer, New, Camera. We'll use the 28mm preset and click OK. Next, choose Layer, New, Null Object and make this a 3D layer. Let's parent the camera to the null and let's also turn on the 3D switch for both Stitches precomps as well as the Denim PNG. Now let's scrub down in the timeline to 12 seconds and hit P to reveal the position of the null. And let's set a keyframe by left-clicking the position stopwatch. This will be the end position for our camera move. Let's also hit Shift R to reveal the rotation and let's set keyframes for the orientation. Let's scrub back in the time to frame zero. So let's reorient the null 90 degrees in the Z direction and also about 80 degrees in the Y direction. Let's select both keyframes and hit F9 to easy ease or you can right click and choose keyframe assistant easy ease. Not looking too bad, but I want the camera position to be a little closer to the stitches before we pull out. So I'm going to track forward in the Z to where we're really close and then see how that looks. You kind of do a nice pull back here and rotate out as the stitches come on. As a final touch for our camera, let's add a little depth of field. Let's grab the camera and twirl down the camera options and turn the depth of field on. And let's increase the aperture quite a bit to maybe something like 75. Let's also increase the blur level to 200% to really exaggerate this effect. As a final touch, you can also animate the focus distance so that you rack focus during the animation. Set a keyframe and move this down to the end. And then I'm going to adjust the initial value so the focus distance is a little closer since at this point we're much closer to the initial stitches. Next, let's add a little more attention to the center of our scene by adding a vignette. I'm going to choose Layer, New, Adjustment Layer. And I'm going to choose Effect, Color Correction, exposure. Now with the adjustment layer selected, let's grab the ellipse tool here and just double click. Then let's hit F to reveal the mask feather properties and feather this out quite a bit. Maybe a value of about 150. Now let's adjust the exposure down to about negative 4. Let's invert the mask and now the edges are nice and dark while the center stays pretty bright. I think I actually want to feather this out even more to give it a much softer look. There, I think about 260 works well. Just to keep things straight, let's rename this vignette. 
Now I want to create a little overall color correction. So from the menu, I choose Layer, New, Adjustment Layer. Choose Effect, Magic Bullet Mojo, Mojo. And this is a great little plugin for doing all kinds of overall color corrections really fast. Let's adjust some of these settings. I'm going to adjust the Mojo amount down a little bit to about 10. I'll leave the tint where it is as well as the Mojo balance. I'm going to actually bring up the warmth of the scene to about 50 to really bring out the coppery look of the stitches. I'm going to punch it up from 25 to 60 and also desaturate it a little bit by increasing the bleach it value from 0 to 20. Now by using these Mojo settings we've kind of darkened this up a bit and I want to bring back some of that light. So let's add Effect, Color Correction, Curves, and let's bump up the RGB value just a little bit. And there you have it. We have a cool animation with particular stitches that auto-orient to the motion path of the emitter. Now there's a million different ways you can use this effect. I've personally used it to recreate footprints on a map similar to the Marauders map in Harry Potter. In addition to particular, the auto-orientation expression has other uses too. Like you could use it to drive the rotation of a compass needle based upon the movement of something on the screen. Or you could use it for something like accurately driving the numbers on a heads-up display. I'm probably only touching the tip of the iceberg here. I want to see what you guys can come up with. So in order to get your creative juices flowing, I'm going to entice you with a giveaway. That's right, I'm going to give away a free copy of my particular 2.0 training DVD, Practical Particles, to the person that comes up with the best implementation of this technique. All you need to do is email a link to your final video to particlegiveaway at yahoo.com by May 15th, 2010. After that date, I'll review all the videos, and the person who really knocks my socks off will be receiving a free copy of Practical Particles, courtesy of me and Creative Cow. Please send me the link to the video, not the video itself, as I don't want to miss anybody's video if it's too big for my mailbox to handle. Well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial, and the math didn't fry your brain too much. I thank you for watching, and I'm looking forward to all of your excellent submissions for the giveaway. Until next time, this is Michael Park. Thanks, Mike. Very interesting stuff, and always good to have a particle-based sewing kit when you're traveling the web. Anyway, if you enjoyed this tutorial and you want to add a particle-based thimble, or maybe a pair of tweezers or a nose hair clipper to your set of particle-based tools, uh, that's all metaphor, by the way, uh, check out Mike's awesome aforementioned Creative Cow Master Series training DVD, Practical Particles, which focuses on the use of particular in visual effects and motion graphics. You can find that DVD at training.creativecow.net. And you can find our host, the esteemed Mr. Park, over at creativecow.net, moderating the Trapcode forum. And of course, if you want to try Trapcode Particular, you can always download a free trial at redgiantsoftware.com. Oh, and hey, uh, speaking of free, Check out redgiantpeople.com, our new website for sharing presets for Trapcode Particular and many, many other Red Giant software products. Did I mention it was free? Oh, yeah. Once again, I'm Aaron Rabinowitz for redgianttv.com. I'll see you next time.